Hello everybody and welcome to GMD Investments. This is the first video actually that I'm making um, and I'm going to be doing it uh, basically focusing on financial reports of, um, of a business. Uh, the business we're choosing today is Google. Um, if we actually pull up Google stock on the internet here, so you just search in Google on stock, <laughs> search Google on Google. So we pull it up and the, I like to use this a lot because it's kind of gives you a nice sort of trend and you can see throughout uh, 2004 all the way to 2023, you can sort of see the scale of the business and the growth and it really is impeccable actually, um, as you can see there. As we see below, the market cap of Google is 1.61 trillion. Now, this is basically, if you wanted to buy the, the, the business outright, you wanted to buy the whole business, it would cost you 1.61 trillion today. Now, that is fluctuates a fair amount um, on the daily, but that is what you would buy that for today if you wanted to buy it. It would cost you 1.61 trillion, which really puts stuff in perspective of how large this business really is. Uh, the P.E. ratio is 28.61, as we can see. Uh, this is basically the price relative to the earnings. Um, we are go into more detail as, as the uh, video goes on. But really, before I sort of dive into the financial reports of Google, um, I want to sort of um, look into the difference between active stock picking and passive investing. Now, um, I think people don't understand when you're a stock picker the amount of sort of research and study that goes into it. Um, I think people convince themselves that they've done good research, uh, like they go on YouTube and they look at someone, oh, this is a great investment, and they think, oh, that looks quite good. And, you know, but they don't, they're not, they don't understand the numbers, they don't understand how the business works, how they make money, you know, have they got a lot of debt, little debt, they don't understand, you know, anything, they haven't looked at nothing, they've just sort of gone off what someone's saying on YouTube, and they've agreed with him, and they just follow everyone else, like, but, you know, Let's be real here. If it was that easy, everyone would be rich. So um, we need to really put things in perspective. And believe me, from experience, the stock market can be a very um, scary and dangerous place. Um, you know, and if 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 uh, if you're very if you're new to it, it can really uh, humble you very very quickly. So this is something I just want to warn investors before we begin, um, because it really is just so important. Um, and the thing is that you need to understand is passive investing, um, it's actually a great thing. I mean, most stock pickers and most people that try and beat the market do not beat the market. I mean, we are talking about 95%, probably even more than that. You know, 95%, 98% of people, for example, don't beat the market. They don't beat that average annual return of 10%, which is what the S&P 500 um uh, generates if if we pull up now i'm going to actually pull up the s p 500 on here and we can have a look and sort of see what that's the returns of what that has produced uh, this will go all the way back from 1983 so that's kind of uh 40 years give or take um and it's that is an annual average return of 10 percent, as we can see here and not many people beat that and this is so easy you just buy it and you don't look at it. It's as simple as that. And you add money in as, you know, so if, if the market, you know, um, if there's a bear market, you can add more money in. It's that simple. You, you haven't got to do no work. Uh, and you'll probably end up, you'll probably find that you'll do a lot better than people that are doing loads of work. So don't think that you have to be an active stock picker to do well in, in, in investing. You know what I mean? And, um, and all right, fair enough, passive investing, it won't, it won't give you remarkable results. But it's 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 no work. It's it's not any work you have to do. So this is why I love investing. Is it's it's just such a you know you can make money from people um, working and hustling every day, doing the work for you. You know, people at Google are doing the hard work, the innovative ideas that they're coming up with and driving that business. And all you've got to do is simply buy it. And and the S and P five hundred is actually five hundred businesses. Um, and it makes up around 95% um, of US equities. Um, so I would say it's the general kind of US equity market. That's, that's the basis to go off is the uh, S&P 500. Um, and if you believe in the US economy 
and you like the innovation and the, you know um, I don't think it will be as good as the last 40 years um, but do I think it will be a bad investment God no I think the the US is still you you can see on a day-to-day basis the innovation and um, the size of their economy and the strength of their economy I mean they're gonna have their downturns just like any other um, country this is just how capitalism works you know it has its goods it has its bads um it's just how it works you know it's the economic cycle you know you know it just goes round and round and round um and you're going to have good times you're going to have bad times um but you can capitalize off of the bad times this is something we need to understand as investors so yeah that that's just something i wanted to really um dive into before we start going into this because we you you really want to ask yourself that question before you even begin diving into financial reports and wanting to become a stock picker you need to ask yourself is this something i genuinely want to do because it's not for everybody um you know you, you, you. but this video hopefully will give people an idea of whether they enjoy it or not and you know you can you can really learn something um so anyway, yeah, so so we're, let's uh, dive in to the video. Now we're going to look into the financial reports of Google. So there's two ways of doing this. Um, you can either search in Google Investor Relations. Now every single public company has an Investor Relations page that you can go on. Or what I like to do is I like to go on the SEC website. So if we search in now sec.gov, we come to the page and then you will go to filings company filing search as you can see here and you would search in the ticker now if you don't know the ticker you can search in the name of the company as well so google would be g-o-o-g-l and you can find it there which is alphabet you click on that and then we want to be looking at the 10k annual report which gives us the um, every single sort of you know uh, sort of the yearly, what they've done for the year, over the year, which is what we want. Um, so we come down here and you can find the balance sheet. So this is going to be the first stage of what we're looking at. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit this all in one video because it's quite, as you can see, it's quite a lengthy sort of process. Um, but this is all for the, the um, you know, striving stock pickers out there that I know would be massively interested in learning what all these things mean. Because right now, anyone can look at this and if this, this sort of language that's being used is accounting, which is just the business language that, that, uh, that they use. Now, if any sort of random person comes on here, they're going to look at this and think, well, this ain't much use to me because I don't really know what any of these things mean. I mean, what is marketable securities, uh, property and equipment, you know, and then we come to accounts payable, accrued expenses and other, you know, long term debt, total, you know, short term debt. You, you know, you got a lot of stuff, stockholder equity, you know, all of these things on their own don't mean much, but when you sort of piece it together and you understand the language um, and you can kind of, you know, um, use different ratios and percentages, et cetera, et cetera, this really can uh, form a very good analysis of a company. And it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely, um, it, you know, it's, it's essential to go through this, uh, this sort of study. So yeah, let's uh, let's go through the balance sheet. Okay, right. So starting off with the balance sheet, as we can see on the SEC website, this is Google, uh, Google's uh, financial statements. As you can see, like I said, the balance sheet of Google. Um, as you can see here in the brackets at the top of the screen, it says in millions. So if we see, for example, this number here, twenty one. Um, this is basically twenty one billion eight hundred seventy nine million. So that's genuinely the layout of. Um, so don't you know? Don't get confused when you might think three hundred sixty-five thousand. This isn't really. This doesn't seem like Google because it's three hundred sixty-five billion is that total assets number there that we can see as well. Um, so basically, a balance sheet is separated into two sections. You've got the assets at the top, and at the bottom you've got your liabilities and your stockholders' equity, right? So if we start off with the assets, you've got your current assets. Now your current assets are basically assets that can be converted into cash within a year. So this, is, uh, this can easily be converted into cash pretty much. So this involves cash and cash equivalents, marketable securities, which is another word for short-term investments, 
uh, your that's your total cash cash equivalent so this is basically this and this added up so that's 21 billion 879 million plus 91 billion 883 billion uh, sorry million which equals 113 billion that's a real mouthful to say i think i'm going to try and round them numbers up it'll be a lot easier um as we go down accounts receivable is another form of current assets inventory and other current assets which is like a sludge funds uh, that's kind of another word for it um so that will be your total current asset to the business 164 billion that's of 2022 and then you've got your 2023 number so it's quite nice you can see kind of the difference uh, from 2022 numbers to 2023 but really as a stock picker we want to look over several years we want to see the growth over several years not just you know two years we want to look a bit more in depth than that but but for this video we're just going through breaking down sort of what these uh what these names and numbers mean um so yes that's your current assets and then we move on to non-current assets so these are basically assets that can't be converted into cash within the year this will take a lot longer to convert these into cash so you have non-marketable securities which as we can see that was short-term investments at the top this is long-term investments. Um, you've got deferred income taxes, property and equipment, operating lease assets, intangible assets, goodwill. So the goodwill is basically, I know this looks a bit weird, goodwill, what the hell is that? So goodwill is basically something where, so say Google buys a piece of a business and they buy that above book value of the business. Now, book value, again, This I need to make this video kind of as concise as possible, so we're go, we won't go into every detail. Um, so, base, but the general thing is they buy it above book value, and the difference from where they buy it at from where book value is, the excess that they've brought above book value, that goes under the heading goodwill. So you can see that they have 28, well, let's round that up to 29 billion of goodwill, which means that they have ex excess of 29 billion from the book value and where they brought it. The difference is 29 billion. Um, and that, that basically goes under goodwill. Now, if we break this down even further, the current assets are also referred to as working assets of the business, um, basically because they're in cycle of cash going to buy inventory. So the cash basically buys gets the inventory the products that are needed um, and then they are sold to the vendors and that becomes accounts receivable then the accounts receivable is collected from the vendors and that turns back to cash so it's basically cash to inventory to accounts receivable back to cash this is also referred to as the current asset cycle so this is basically how you get you, your um, your assets to work for you. This is a working asset. This is how the business sort of makes money. This is the general aspect of it. So the cash and cash equivalents basically tells you um, two things. So a higher number of cash or cash equivalents may tell you that a company is generating tons of cash, which is a great thing. But it can also mean that it's just sold a business or a ton of bonds, which may not be a good thing. So this is basically where investigation comes into play. If you see a large number of cash and cash equivalents, you think, oh, that's fucking, that seems amazing. You really need to be looking into depth just in case they haven't sold a ton of bonds or a business. Um, so yeah, that's just investigation needs to be taking place. Um, but a low amount of cash usually means that the company has poor economics. So you wanna stay away from them businesses as, as, mu as much as you can. Um, since cash earns a low rate of return sitting in a bank account, it is better to employ the cash assets in a business operations or investments that produce a higher rate of return. Um, this is what we all this is what all great investors look for is people that can allocate their capital, that can put their cash into you can work their cash and uh, produce higher rates of returns, which in essence gives us investors you know higher profits overall. So obviously inventory is pretty straightforward. Um, inventory is just the products that is warehoused to basically sell to the vendors. Um, the only thing with inventory we've got to be careful with is, is there's always a risk of the inventory becoming obsolete. 
So what we're looking for is we're looking for a company where the products will never, never basically never change um, that they sell, um, which basically means it's a lot, um, you know, it's a lot less of a risk of it becoming obsolete, pretty much. Oh, another one is property and equipment. So this you want to be careful with um, because really a company with a competitive advantage, they won't have to spend loads of money on upgrading their property equipment constantly. The thing you've got to remember is if you're constantly having to upgrade your property equipment because you're in a competitive industry where you have to stay above your competitors and you have to constantly upgrade that property and equipment, it's just eating away at the underlying profits. So this is something you've got to remember. Um, so a simple business like Coca-Cola, they won't have to constantly upgrade their property and equipment. So intangible assets are basically assets that we can't physically touch. So this would include trademarks, franchises, uh, brand names, copyrights, all that kind of stuff. So Coca-Cola's brand name, for example, is worth an excess of 100 billion. Um, but because it's uh, an internally developed name, um, its real value as an intangible asset is not reflected on the Coca-Cola's balance sheet. Non-marketable securities is basically another word for long-term investments. Um, if you're a company, for example, Berkshire Hathaway, um, long-term investments for you is really um, the core of your, uh, you know, your money-making machine that that he has uh, sort of built into his business of just compound wealth. Um, but we're, we're uh, we'll leave this out for this video. It's quite a sort of we'll leave that for another video, and we can go through Berkshire and sort of look into how they make money because it's a really sort of um, incredible phenomenon. So again, at the very bottom of all these assets, so current assets and non-current assets, we have our total assets, which is basically all of the assets, non-current, current assets, all added up is the total assets of the business. Now, this is basically current assets plus long-term assets is the total assets. Um, another funny thing about total assets is it will match the liabilities, the total liabilities, plus the shareholders' equity. There's a reason why it's called a balance sheet because they both they balance each other. The total assets is equal to the um, total liabilities plus the shareholder equity. Um, now, something we can do with the total assets is we can find out basically how um, efficient the company is in putting its assets to use. So to measure this, we can do net earnings divided by total assets. Um, and this return on assets uh, will basically mean, uh, we'll, we'll kind of identify whether the company has a competitive advantage. Okay, so now we're done with all the assets, we're gonna be moving on to the liabilities. So they work very similar, but the liabilities is basically money owed. It's not money that they own, it's money that they owe. So we start off with current liabilities. This is basically debts and obligations that the company owes um, coming within the fiscal year, that's due within the fiscal year. Um, they are found on, on the balance sheet under the headings of accounts payable, accrued expenses, short-term debt and long-term debt, which we're gonna go through now. Accounts payable is basically money owed to suppliers that have provided goods and services to the company on credit. Um, accrued expenses are liabilities that the company has incurred but has yet to be invoiced for. Uh, these expenses may include sales tax payable, uh, wages payable and accrued rent payable. Okay, so a quick rundown of short-term debt. This is basically money that is owed by the corporation and is due within the year. Um, short-term money actually has been historically much cheaper than long-term money. Um, this means that it's possible to make money borrowing short term and lending out long term. This is basically what banks do the majority of the time and this is how they make their money. The only trouble with doing this is by borrowing short term debt, it has to be paid off within the year. So they have to borrow more money uh, short term to pay off the debt. Uh, this is basically a process called rolling over the debt. Um, so it seems like a great idea, but... The problem is short-term rates can jump, um, they can massively skyrocket, which means that they have to refinance their short-term debt at a rate in excess of what they loaned it out at. Um, so really, the smartest and safest way to make money in banking is to basically borrow long-term and lend it out long-term. Um, this is what we're looking for because, you know, banks that are continuously borrowing at short-term, um, you know, short-term money and they're lending it long-term it's a very dangerous game um, 
uh, yeah, so there's a reason why banks, you know, try and lock us in those five and ten year CDs, you know. That's something that they uh, they can make money off of. So when looking at long-term debt, it's basically the opposite. So it's debt that matures any time out past a year. Um, on the balance sheet, it comes under long-term liabilities. So great companies, which are the, obviously the companies we're looking for, often have little or no long-term debt on their balance sheets. Um, this is because basically the company is so profitable that they're self, they, they are um, self-financing when they need to expand the business or make acquisitions. So there's never, there's no need to borrow large sums of money. Um, if we look, we will always want to look over the last sort of 10 years to get a good idea on this. Um, and if we see that there's over them 10 years, there's little or no long-term debt, this means that it will, it will probably be a very good long-term bet. So deferred income taxes is pretty much taxes that is due but hasn't been paid yet. Something we can use to really give us a good outlook on whether it's a good business or not is the total liabilities and the debt to the shareholders equity ratio. Uh, so this is something where um, it's, been, it's been able to help us identify whether or not a company is using debt to finance its operations or equity. Uh, the company with the company that is uh, a good company and that we should invest in is some is a company that uses its earnings power to finance its operations and therefore in theory should show a higher level of shareholders equity and a lower level of total liabilities so the equity so the ratio is basically total liabilities divided by shareholders equity something to note out that i think is very important is understanding that with financial institutions like banks the ratios will always, um, on average, tend to be much higher than other industries. The reason being, banks borrow tremendous amounts of money and then loan it all back out, uh, making money on the spread between what they paid for the money and what they can loan it out for. Um, this leads to basically an enormous amount of liabilities, which are offset by a tremendous amount of assets. So whenever, whenever you're looking at banks, I mean, if you go onto JP Morgan and you go onto their um, annual reports and you look through it, you're going to see literally assets of trillions and liabilities of trillions. You're going to see it very sort of matching um, huge assets, huge liabilities because they're, they, they're a very leveraged operation. That's how they, that's how they make money. So yeah, so that's something to, to just look out for. So the general rule for this uh, ratio is, unless we're looking at banks, which we're not, um, the equity ratio should be below 0 0.8 um, to ensure the company has a good, ch uh, good chance in having a competitive advantage. So when we're looking at Google here, um, if you actually divide these total liabilities for, so if we, if we look at 2022 numbers, if you divide the total liabilities of 109 billion, uh, 120 million that is there, uh, if you divide that by the total stockholders equity of 256 billion, you're going to get something around 0.42, I believe it is. So you can see that that's well below 0.8, which is the general rule. So this is definitely a company with a competitive advantage for sure. So as you can see under the stockholders equity heading, you have preferred and common stock. I'm going to leave this out today because I want to sort of explain that more in depth in another video. Um, and I just don't think we have time to really do that. So I'm going to leave that out for today. But if you go further below, you have something called retained earnings. Now, this is probably the most important sort of thing to find a competitive uh well to find a company with a competitive advantage pretty much um retained earnings is something where basically the earnings that they gain from uh business they're basically retaining they're holding on to their earnings and they can do stuff with their earnings. So for Berkshire Halfway will retain their earnings and they invest that into companies where they can make more money. Um, retained earnings is just one of the most important things. You're looking for a higher number. And as you can see, Google has 195 billion of retained earnings. And this is great. And if you're seeing it growing over the years, that's something we really want to look for. We want to look for. We want to really, uh, that's a great thing to have is a continuous growth in retained earnings. Last but not least for the balance sheet is the shareholders' equity. Uh, this is the total assets minus the total liabilities. Um, it's actually the same as preferred and common stock plus paid in capital plus retained earnings minus treasury stock. 
that was a bit of a mouthful, but it is the same. Um, the return on shareholders' equity is the net earnings divided by shareholders' equity, which is, like I said, the return on shareholders' equity. Um, the companies that benefit from a competitive advantage show higher than average returns on shareholder equity. Um, if I name some examples, you've got Coca-Cola has 30% return on equity, shareholders' equity, sorry. Wrigley, uh, 24%. Pepsi, 34%. Um, basically, the general thing is higher returns on equity means that the company is making good use of the earnings that it is retaining. Uh, as time goes on, this will increase the underlying value of the business. So again, this is, you know, like we said about retained earnings, it, it, it's what they're doing with that to improve the return on stockholder equity. This is what we are as investors looking for the most.